Good morning, Bitcoiners, and welcome back to your economic calendar, the news you need for the week ahead in Bitcoin. Today is Tuesday, September the 6th, and this week we get over eight central banks meeting and announcing interest rate decisions, as well as seven speeches from Fed members in the United States. So here's what you need to know for the week ahead in Bitcoin. As we mentioned, central banks are out in full force this week with over eight central banks meeting and announcing interest rate decisions, including Australia, Canada, Chile, the European Union, Poland, Malaysia, Peru, and others. Um, we just got the news out of Australia, which, as anticipated, increased interest rates by 50 basis points this morning. Another 50 basis points interest rate hike is expected out of Chile. And investors expect 75 basis points uh, in terms of increases in Canada and at the European Central Bank. This is all happening ahead of the Fed meeting, which happens on September 21st. So just in a few weeks from now, we're going to break down the details shortly. Now, importantly, these interest rate decisions are coming on the back of an already fragile economic backdrop, particularly in the EU, which we will break down shortly. In places like Sydney and Toronto, which are the main real estate hubs of Australia and Canada, you are already starting to see real estate prices come down. And this is a trend that will likely accelerate thanks to these increases in interest rates. Now, these types of self-inflicted pain by central banks is effectively them having to choose between the lesser of two evils. If they do not increase interest rates, their currencies risk weakening further against the US dollar, which is going to make asset prices soar and inflation soar locally, which is exactly what they're trying to tame. And as an example, here we're showing the graph that basically you can see the dollar versus the euro, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar and Chilean peso. And we see here that effectively all of these currencies have lost quite a significant amount of value versus the US dollar so far into the year, with the best performing one being the Canadian dollar, which has only lost about 4% of its value year to date. Now, a big reason, if not the main reason, why central banks globally seem to be rushing in a coordinated manner to increase interest rates is because they are trying to keep up with the US central bank's interest rates. As we know, the Federal Reserve has been increasing interest rates aggressively in the United States, having done two jumbo rate hikes of 75 basis points in their last two meetings. They are actually scheduled to meet again on September 21st for a new interest rate decision. And looking at the CME FedWatch tool, we can see that investors are pricing in a 60% probability of a 75 basis points hike and a 40% probability of a 50 basis points hike. Now, usually these types of races between central banks end up with one or more central banks being unable to keep up to, with their increases in interest rates due to political pressures and economic pain. Looking at the macro backdrop, it looks as though Europe is in for a very tough winter and the European Central Bank is just starting on its rate hike cycle. This has many macro investors positioning themselves short against the euro. Now, as we know, increasing interest rates causes a lot of pain in the economy as it increases mortgage rates, rent rates, the cost to service corporate debt, etc. So it adds pain to the economy. And the question in many people's minds is, at what point will central banks be done? Where is the target rate for the Fed? And now, while it does still feel like a very long and painful road ahead, the same CME FedWatch tool that we looked at for the September meeting can be seen for the July 2023 meeting, which is the farthest out that they show. And from here, we can see that about 70% of investors believe that the overnight rate in the United States will stay at around 4% all the way through July of next year. Now, why this is important is because that overnight rate is currently at 2.5%. And if we assume 50 basis points or 75 basis points in a couple of weeks time, that would put us very well within shooting range of that 4% target interest rates meaning it's starting to feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel in terms of how far or how high the Fed can potentially take interest rates. Now, all that being said, markets could still remain under pressure as we lead up to the meeting and then some as central banks continue to essentially tighten up conditions to the global economy in an attempt to keep up with the Fed. So we're not out of the woods yet, but it seems like light is starting to peak towards the end of the tunnel. Now, interestingly, if we look at the S&P 500, as we have covered here in the past, the head of equity strategies for both Bank of America and Morgan Stanley had given their projections as to where they, where they thought the S&P could end the year. And their projections were on the high end 
3,900 points, and on the low end, 3,600 points. Um, last week's move, as we see in today's move, have, has brought the S&P 500 to below 3,900 points, which has already hit one of the analysts' expectations. And the low or the most bearish call was for 3,600 uh, points to end the year. Now, interestingly, this move last week coincided with the Bank of America bull and bear indicator moving from zero, extreme bearishness, higher to one. And this is the first time that this indicator has moved since October 2021. And this was effectively when the market started turning. Now, why this is also interesting is because if we draw a potential risk return between the lowest or most bearish call from the analysts, which is a, a, would represent a loss of potentially 7.58%, as you can see from the graph, um, if we get to the 3600. However, if the S&P 500 does turn a corner and head back to the previous highs, this sets up a potential 20% profit. So a potential 8% drawdown on a bearish uh, call versus a potential 22% gain if it returns back to the highs starts looking a lot more attractive in terms of risk return for investors. And not surprisingly, this has caused the bull and bear indicator to start ticking higher. Now, there are many things that could get in the way of this potentially clear path forward. Remember, although central banks are supposed to be apolitical, their decisions to increase interest rates affect everybody in the economy by raising rents, mortgages, the amount of corporate debt that has to be paid. So the consequences are very real and the banks have to essentially manage their goals versus the political implications that basically carrying out these policies will affect. And this is uh, very well exemplified with what's happening in Europe. We are starting to see riots uh, essentially in certain parts of Europe, Europe thanks to increasing energy prices. The German government just essentially uh, came out this morning saying that they expect there to be social unrest throughout the winter. And the biggest problem is effectively what is happening in the European energy markets. And while this is a very, very complex subject, we're going to try to effectively try to simplify what's happening to get a sense of how it could impact uh, the economy of these countries going forward and how it potentially could impact markets. So in overly simplistic terms, what ended up happening last week was that a G7 coalition agreed to impose a price cap on Russian oil. And this is an attempt to cap Russia's revenues, which are continuing to fund the conflict in Ukraine. Now, with, without missing a beat, uh, Russia effectively responded by indefinitely suspending uh, the Nord Stream gas pipeline to Europe, which sent prices of gas in Europe soaring. Now, interestingly, governments have also depleted their strategic oil reserves recently in a bid to bring oil prices down and essentially help fight inflation. These reserves, as you can see, as depleted as they are, will have to get replenished effectively at some point in the future. This means that there will be additional excess demand uh, above what is already needed by the economy to replenish these reserves, which could keep pressure uh, on oil prices to make them essentially pushing them higher as we move forward from this. Now, to get around this, central banks are trying to destroy demand as fast as they can by raising interest rates. But again, they may hit a political wall as they try to do this. The US has an important midterm election this November. And as we mentioned, news of riots and forecasts of future unrest are already starting to pop up in Europe. So it's important to keep an eye on that because that's the political limit to what a central bank can do. And as always, we wrap up with a summary of what's ahead for the week. As we mentioned this week, we get interest rate decisions from eight central banks, including Australia, which we just got, Canada, Chile, the European Central Bank, among others. I'm gonna break those down shortly. A quick note on Chile. Chile's highly anticipated vote on a new constitution was celebrated over the weekend and yielded a resounding no result. As we've been covering here for the last few weeks, Chile's currency has come under pressure, so and it was uh, relatively oversold uh, compared to the Brazilian real and other commodity exporter peers in the region. And so the Chilean peso should benefit and the equity markets should benefit in the next few weeks. In our blog, we also have details of how that could imply lithium and other markets, which uh, Chile is a big producer of. But now on to the important data that comes out this week. Uh, today, we got the decision from the Australian Central Bank. We also get a Fed speech at 10 a.m. 
from a Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Mester. Later today, we also get a decision from the Chilean central bank expecting 50 base points increase there. And at 2 p.m. today, we get another Fed speech from Michael Barr. He is the vice chair for banking supervision at the Fed. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we get an interest rate decision from the Bank of Poland and another interest rate decision from the Bank of Canada, which is expected to increase rates by 75 basis points. That's at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Thursday, we get the decision from the European Central Bank, which again, another ex the expectation here is for 75 basis points. 9 a.m., we get a Fed speech from Jerome Powell speaking at the Cato Institute. At noon, we get another Fed speech, Chicago Fed President Charles Evans. And at 2 p.m., we get comments from SEC Commissioner Gary Gensler. Lastly, on Friday, we have two Fed speeches, uh, 10 a.m. Chicago Fed President Charles Evans, and noon, we get Kansas City Fed President Esther George. Oh, we also get a third Fed President speech on Friday, which is Fed Governor Chris Wallace. Uh, so again, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. is when those speeches are happening. Big, big week uh, in terms of Fed speeches and central bank activity. As always, we will continue to keep you posted and see you next week. Los quiero mucho.